I'd like to preach a message entitled, What America Needs Most Right Now. What America Needs Most Right Now. If you were to think about that question before we begin, and we were somehow to, able to hand out a blank piece of paper and you were to write down what you think the answer to that question is, I wonder how many different answers that we would get. I hope that the Word of God would open our hearts and help us to understand, truly understand, what our country needs. Let's begin with prayer. Father, thank you for the good worship time that we had. Lord, hear our prayers from the beginning of those who called out for our country in humility and asking you, Lord, we know that you're the only one that can do anything about it. I thank you so much for the, the great gospel that we heard, that we were able to sing, and uh, just thinking about your great love for us. It is marvelous because we, did, we don't deserve it at all. It is marvelous because you, the God of all justice and righteousness, chose to have mercy on, on sinners and enemies, your enemies, and, and glorious. And yet, you continue to pour your love on us, and you'll pour your love on us throughout all eternity. It's beyond what we can understand. And uh, I praise you, and I thank you for it. I ask you, sweet Holy Spirit, great comforter of all time, that you would please open up our eyes, that you would illuminate the word of God today. I want to ask Jesus that you would help me, Lord, to lift you up. You are the master. You are the Lord. All power is given unto you, and I want to lift you up in, in what is being preached. And so, Lord, help us. We thank you so much that we can ask these things, knowing that you hear what we pray in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Broken. It's a hard word, but it's a real word. It's the reality. Broken. It seems like our country... Somehow, even though we weren't watching, we weren't realizing it, we didn't expect it, it just feels broken. You wake up the next day and you, you hope that somehow that you're going to wake up four months ago and you're just going to be thinking about your vacation, you're just going to be thinking about your family, you're going to think about what you're going to do next, you're going to think about a prosperous and an enjoyable summer, broken. Our country is so divided and right is being called wrong and wrong is being called right. We all know that the solution will not come from Washington. This congregation, and I am sure that those at home, have given up that hope and realized that that's not our answer long ago. We, we understand that the solution will not come from the next election or the next one or the next one or the next one or the past one. The solution will not come even from great movements or Great organizations, although there are times to stand up and speak. The solution will not come from reform or protests or pulling down statues or even crying at home or running to another country. It is not cliche for me to tell you this morning in any way. And I, pray, I, I hope that you all know me. You understand that I'm not looking to preach a 4th of July cliche message and what I'm about to say to some of you, you might check out. Don't do it. You're going to hear by the end what, what I'm talking about. It is not cliche for me to tell you this morning that the solution to our problem is Jesus' gospel. Is Jesus' gospel. Now, I, everyone in the room agrees with me. Everybody's shaking their head and people at home saying amen also. I want to show you, I want to take you on a journey and to understand that that is not just true in surface level, but there are hows, hows, H-O-W-S's, plural, there are hows about why that is true that we need to think about that maybe we never thought before of how the solution to America's problems, the world's problems, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. As I grew up hearing uh, the story of the gospel, I don't remember ever a time that I did not hear it. I grew up in church and and just from the very first days, and I just, you know, from, from junior churches to Sunday schools, which I'm so glad there were teachers who told me the gospel. As I, I grew up hearing the gospel that all people are sinners and under God's wrath and needed a Savior, I understood that that, the, the, that only means that Jesus, 2,000 years ago, came and he died on the cross for my sins and for your sins. I understood that. But as I heard that, I understood that only as a rescue plan that would get me out of hell and into heaven. And certainly that is true. I take nothing from that. You know, we, we get to spend eternity in that heavenly country. Amen? Yes? Looking forward to that? Man, as I get older, and unfortunately I am, 
uh, I realize more and more of why people love to sing about heaven. I'm looking forward to that. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But what we need to understand, what we must understand, what we need to go deeper in our Christianity in is that the gospel is, Jesus' gospel is not just a rescue plan from hell to heaven. It is so much more. What I did not understand until much later through the word of God and teaching and passages of real scripture is that Jesus' death and resurrection reversed every sinful and horrible result that came from that moment Adam and Eve disobeyed God and the world fell into the curse of sin. And let me just tell you, the answer to why do so many horrible things happen and why is there so many horrible things, it came from that very first story of Adam and Eve disobeying God And when you disobey a holy God, judgment will come. And that wages of sin has been playing out now for humpteen, humpteen years. Every result, though, of war, of starvation, of disease, of depression, of racism, of anger, of violence, of hate, of selfishness, of murder, of loneliness, of debt, of grief, of anxiety, etc., every bit of the negativity of this world and anything you could come up with is, listen to this, addressed and resolved either immediately in Jesus' gospel, gradually in Jesus' gospel, or ultimately or eventually by and through Jesus' gospel. Do we understand that? What Jesus did on the cross and the resurrection in the greatest way wasn't just our ticket out of hell. It was to reverse every disobedience, and the result of it against holy God. The gospel is the solution. I'll let you test that truth of the gospel. I hope you'll try to test it all day long and all week long about anything bad that you can think about and how the gospel is the solution. But I want us to understand that in the results of Jesus' gospel, now listen to this, in the results of what happened because the obedient son of God came and lived a perfect life and died on that cross, and rose from that grave, and what that meant by the power and the authority of God, and the judicial working of God, by that power, and by the promises that come from the gospel, and by the relationship that we can have with God that comes from the gospel, and our own identity, and the privileges of the gospel, and the future of the gospel, every trouble that we know is immediately, gradually, or ultimately solved. That was a whole lot more than I knew at 10 years old when I accepted Jesus as my Savior. The gospel is so much more than a ticket from hell to heaven. It is a solution for all of our issues of life, and it is what America needs most right now. Let's look at that in the word, Colossians chapter 3, please, in your Bibles. Colossians chapter 3. I would like to show you 13 verses about how the gospel is the solution. Colossians chapter 3. Give you a second. Colossians chapter 3. Would you stand for the wonderful, precious, authoritative, inspired word of God? Here is what God says. If ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Kill, therefore, or mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, that is, those who have not yet been saved, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them, all those sins, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, blasphemy, malice, excuse me, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, Lie not to one another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, now look at this, which is renewed in knowledge 
after the image of him that created him. What? Talking about creation? What? Verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on this, vows of mercies and kindness and humbleness of mind and meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel, a fight, a war against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Maybe may be seated. Please see in the passage, first of all, Jesus' gospel causes us to know that we are dead and we must be made alive. Okay, let me say that again. The heading, the title of the message is What America Needs Most Now. All right, point number one, Jesus' gospel causes us to know that we are dead and, and must be made alive. Look at verse number one, if ye then be risen with Christ. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. In this verse, there is an understanding. It's an assumption that comes from the whole context that someone, us, we were once dead. And it says, if you be risen, and that we have been somehow made alive by trusting on Jesus. Just like Jesus, the assumption of the verse, was dead in the tomb, They too, the people being spoken to, they were dead before they came to Jesus. They were dead. As Christians who live in this country, or any other country for that matter, we need to understand that we don't primarily have a political problem, primarily. Although a whole lot of people talk about it. We don't primarily have a law problem, although our justice system needs work. We don't primarily have a moralization problem that we need to superimpose stronger or better or more conservative laws on people. We don't don't primarily have a patriotic problem. We have a death problem. We have a death problem in America. People are so off track in behavior and believing and priorities and and so many destructive things are happening and being thought and being spoken because they are dead in trespasses and in sins. That's the heart of the problem. And making them a Democrat or a Republican or, or whatever is not going to change that. They are dead to God, and they are dead to his wisdom. The whole book of Proverbs speaks about that you cannot have wisdom until first you have the fear of the Lord. And such was every one of us, the passage says, dead whether it pronounced itself so ugly as it is now and rioting and looting and all that, whether it pronounced itself so ugly or not in your life, some it did, some it didn't, it doesn't matter. We were all dead. We were all dead in sins and we were all dead to God. We had no relationship with God. We were alienated from God and we would have stayed, we would have stayed, I don't even know what the right tense is there. We would have stayed We would have totally been alienated for God for the rest of eternity had it not been for Jesus' gospel. Look back at chapter 2, 13. Some of you don't even need to turn the page. It's on the same page. It says this, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he made alive, quickened, made alive, together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. I think sometimes uh, we think we are going to change the world by our next passionate social media post on the subject. Folks, yes, we need to speak up. Yes, we need to be salt and truth. But what fundamentally is wrong with this world is people are dead to God in their sin. Do we understand that? If you understand that, yell amen. Okay, you understand that. Society's solution is for individuals, one by one, to understand that they are sinners before a holy and just God and that he will hold them accountable for their personal sin. They need to own the the sinfulness and throw themselves at the mercy of the Son of God who took all the charges against himself on that cross. He died because they were dead. He died so that they could become alive to God. 
He died so they could become dead then to their sin. That is the solution of the gospel. He arose so that they could be called justified and forgiven and made alive to God for the first time ever. Will you see your sinfulness and believe on Jesus who will make you alive? Those who may be listening here or at home who do not know Jesus. Jesus is risen to sit on the right hand of God's throne and all must turn from their sin and make him the Savior and the Lord of their lives. And the more who do, the more the solution is seen. Politics cannot raise dead people. Can I say that again? All the stronger. As if we turn on the news the next day, and expect it to happen. (laughs) Politics cannot raise dead people. Number two in the passage, Jesus' gospel causes us to love what Christ loves. And then there's a little comma, not this earth. Jesus' gospel causes us to love what Christ loves, not this earth. Look at two through four, chapter three. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For we are, ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. It is interesting, verse 1 says that you are risen, you're alive, and verse 3 says that you're dead. What, is it, what does that mean? I once was dead in sins, and now I'm dead to sins. I'm dead to trying to get any fulfillment out of this world. I'm dead to making the sin and the darkness of this world my Lord. I'm alive to a different Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. I am alive to God and dead to what I've left behind. Verse 4 says, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Point number two, Jesus' gospel causes us to love what Christ loves, not this earth. Jesus' gospel, as I said, I've said it three times now, it's not, folks, it's not just a ticket out of hell like I thought as a 10-year-old boy. It also teaches us that day by day, we must not grasp money and control and respect and the pleasure and the rights of this world. The gospel teaches me to set my affections on higher things, heavenly things, Jesus things. Is that not a lot like America's problem? The great grab for getting more, the great affection of grasping everything from money to rights on this earth. Greed, great greed and covetousness from Wall Street to Main Street. Well, the gospel teaches us that when we are Jesus followers, what matters to him is what should matter to us. What matters to him is what, according to the passage, that I should put my affections on, not myself or what I can grab. The gospel teaches us that many of the conflicts, and this is very important, okay? There's a direct connection of a verse I'm going to show you. Many of the, I would say most, of the conflicts, the quarreling, as the verse the scripture uses, the selfishness of this world can be tracked to our own individual personal greed and selfishness. Do, you, do we remember the James passage about this? James 4, from whence come wars and fightings among you? It's talking about personal quarrels, but even quarrels of, of between nations. Where does it come from? Come they not hence, even of your own lusts, desires, covetousness, greed, that war inside your members. Ye lust and ye have not. You kill, you desire to have, and cannot obtain. You fight, and you war, yet you have not. Because you ask not, ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, or that is with the wrong motives of selfishness, that you might consume it upon your own lusts. James nails why there is conflict, and why there is anger, and why there is yelling, and why there is disagreement, why there is conflict on this earth. It is because we have set our affections on the earth instead of what Christ wants. Verse 2. It is that we want to grab all that we can grab, whether that means true, really tangible things, or whether that means things like privileges, or that means like attention, or status, or rights. America needs to understand that it is it is not about what, what group or which group gets more or what individual gets more. 
It's not about what our country can do for us. Seems like that there was a presidential quote that said that also. But rather that Jesus is our Lord and what matters in heaven is what should matter in the affections of our heart. Jesus is our life, the scripture says here. We have no selfish life anymore. We have no grasping for this life. And I'm just going to say this, and it's probably going to upset some people. Yes, my mantra is God and country, but the country that I'm looking for is in heaven. Our life is hid with Christ in God. Of course, that thinking starts with salvation, But also, a lot of Christians need to be reminded about the truth of the gospel also, that we are pilgrims. You remember that? That we are strangers. You remember him saying that? That we are aliens of this world and this land. Do you remember he said that to us? Our possession lies in glory, according to verse number four. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then we're going to appear with him in glory. Jesus' gospel causes us to love what Christ loves, not this earth. There's a third huge point that shows us that Jesus' gospel is what America needs most in the passage. It's verse 5 through 9. I'm going to give you the point and then read it, this text. It says, Jesus, the point is, Jesus' gospel causes us to put off the sin that once damned us. Jesus' gospel causes us to put off the sin that once damned us. Verse number five says it this way, kill therefore, mortify your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, or inordinate affection, evil, concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which, co- for which things sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience, or those who have never come to Christ, in, in, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. That means that's what you were like the second before Jesus saved you. But now ye also put off all of these, anger, wrath, blasphemy, excuse me, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not to one another, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds. Jesus' gospel causes us to put off the sin that once damned us. When someone really repents, and I use the word really strongly, when they really repent of their sin and turn to Christ as their Savior, they are giving their lives to Jesus as their Lord. And we, this was a huge debate about 25 years ago, 30 years ago. We won't get into the big de- debate, but, but here's the deal. If you need to be saved and you are willing, you, you want Jesus as your Savior, but you're not willing to repent of your sin and follow him as your Lord, you're not ready to be saved. You cannot be saved. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Let me say it this way. No man, no woman has ever lightly taken Jesus. That's what all the stories and the Gospels are about. When people turned and walked away from Jesus, they were not willing to forsake all. They were not willing to repent and turn from sin. They were not willing for Jesus to be their Lord. The Gospel never leaves a person where he is at, but rather calls that saved individual now to live the Gospel life. The Gospel life. I don't understand Modern churches that, yeah, yeah, they might call you, come just as you are, but so many people just leave as they were. No, the gospel changes us. The gospel always, in the word of God, when, it, when we're saved by the gospel, it causes us to live the gospel life. The true gospel believed and received always changes your life. And it's not just a, a one-time simple kaboom, bama, bama. You know, you're just like Jesus Christ, is it? You know, we, we teach and we preach in the scripture, it's all over the word of God and in this passage about day by day growing into the image of Christ. And we're gonna see that a little bit more. Jesus' gospel compels you in this passage here, verse five, to kill, to mortify the sin that once damned you. And I love it. Isn't that so beautiful? Isn't it so beautiful? Let me see if I can get this out because it's not my notes. Isn't it so beautiful that the fact is I'm gonna sin against God today? but I've already been forgiven of of that sin. I don't make a mockery of that. I say that very respectfully. Isn't it an amazing thing in this passage that it's talking about that you've been forgiven of all your sins and yet you know you're going to fail God tomorrow. You're going to fail God next week, whatever. You know, the Bible says it compels you that you are justified, that you have been forgiven. 
It compels you that the gospel attitude is that you kill, that you have a strategy to fight and kill the sin that once damned you. It is your job, your responsibility, though I am totally justified, though I have a reservation in heaven. The 1 Corinthians 1 says God is faithful, faithful to take me, to have that reservation that I am justified and will ever be for him. It is my job to fight my sin with a passion every day. It's an amazing balance. It's a wonderful thing. It's a crazy wonderful thing. Jesus' gospel compels me to kill the sin that once damned me. Notice the list of sins of the heart and of the body in verse number 5 and verse number 8 and verse number 9. Sins of lust and covetousness and attitude and anger and revenge and hate and lies pouring out of my mouth and pouring out of your mouth. Is, folks, is this not what we're seeing on the daily news? Is this not the pictures that were in the video at the beginning? Is this not what we're seeing? It is, the, it is this type of sin. Is this not what we see in our streets right now? Is this not what we have seen called out in the incidents of, of unjust law enforcement? Is this not the reason for years of inequality and prejudice in our land? Is it not the reason that people are doing all kinds of angry things and destructive things because they are still dead in their trespasses and sins? Receiving Jesus' gospel and then living the gospel by dying to that sin is the answer, is the solution for America, folks. The same Lord Jesus who commanded us to love God and to love others commands those delivered from the damnation of our sin to kill the ever-present sin of our thoughts and our hearts and our bodies. I ask you to search your heart, Christian. Does lust, does hate, does prejudice, does anger, does evil communication still remain alive in you? Kill it day by day, and I will say day after day. You may have to rise up every morning and give yourself to kill anger that is inside of you, or prejudice, or hate, or injustice that's inside of you. Kill it, kill it, kill it. The, verse says, the passage says it this way, kill what you have been saved from. Kill and continue to kill what you have been saved from. A crazy balance that I'm totally justified, and yet I live in this flesh, and I'm going to have to fight it every day. Praise the Lord that through Jesus' atonement, we are delivered from God's wrath on that sin, according to verse number 6. But we must practice what Christ has already performed on us and, and in our lives by his gospel. Verse 7 compels us that we used to walk in those sinful ways. But now, since Jesus is our Lord, we are to put off all of those Christian, can I ask you a question? Are you with me? Are you with me at home? All right. I always think about home people. Drink another coffee and it's going to be all right. Okay. Can I ask you if you have been in the business of killing, mortifying the sins in you since last year at this time? Are you growing in killing, in murdering those sins that you have been saved from? that pop their head up and constantly try to drag you back. Praise God they can never drag us back, right? We are saved, we are justified, but we need to be killing every day. Verse 7 compels us that we used to walk in those ways, but now since Jesus is our Lord, we are to put off all of those. That killing of sin in us is the gospel te testimony that unsaved America needs to see right now as light and salt. That Jesus saves and ja Jesus changes us. And the love of God that we saw that was pouring out from the cross can become pouring out of our hearts in the way that we address all of these attitudes in our nation. I beg that the Lord would give us gospel love that dies to anger, that dies to conflict, that dies to fighting. Point number four in the passage, Jesus' gospel causes us to become new people being renewed progressively every day like Jesus who created us. Let me say that one more time. Jesus' gospel causes us to become new people being renewed progressively every day 
like Jesus who created us. Now this is 10 through 13. I hope that I can get this across. Let's go slow here. Look what it says. It says, verse 10, and have put on the new man, which is, now this is the verbiage. This is, this is a deep, deep fountain at the end of verse 10, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Well, obviously God created me, and more particularly John 1 says Jesus was the member of the Godhead who did it. So I'm to, I put on a new man in verse 10, and that new man is day by day progressively being renewed in knowledge after the image of my creator. And then verse 11, shocking, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, that's a nomad warrior that was despised for their violence, bond, that's a slave, nor free, but Christ is all, and in all, it's like the author was reading 2020 news. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and longsuffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Jesus' gospel causes us to become new people being renewed progressively every day like Jesus or into Jesus or after Jesus who created us. The theology of verse 10 is deep. I would encourage you that you would think about it later on today. It's talking about creation. It's unexpected. It just jumps into the end of verse number 10 back to thoughts of creation. God made us in his image, but sin marred that image. But the gospel renews that image. You got that? God made us in his image. Sin mars that image of God. But the gospel of Jesus Christ, when believed on, when trusted on, when a person is born again, the image of God is renewed in their life. Jesus' gospel reverses the curse in us to look like God in whose image we were made the moment we are saved. We are made, the scripture says here, we are made a new man. We still have flesh, but there is a new man in me by Jesus And that new man is renewed day by day in knowing God and putting on the image of God. We are progressively changing. You know, I I say that, I've seen that in tons of passages in the Bible, Galatians, whatever. Sometimes I question that even in my own life. Because you and I have a whole lot longer, a whole, whole much farther to go in this becoming like Jesus, yeah? But this is a promise, this is, this is the truth of what is happening in us. Sometimes the more mature you get as a Christian, the more you see the despicableness of your own heart. Take heart, my dear friends. God is really doing a work in you. Jesus is really reversing the curse in you and making you back into the pure image of God. Take heart! Don't quit! That renewing is described in verse number 12 of what is happening as putting on all the beautiful fruits of God. Mercy and kindness and humbleness and meekness and long-suffering and forbearing and forgiving. If anyone have a quarrel with one another, it's presented here as a command for you to do, but as an action that is being done. It is, it is you are being renewed in the image of God. It is, it says that you, this is happening and you are to make this happen in your life, to put on these things just like Jesus forgave you. You are to put on these aspects of the way you treat other people, of the way you view other people, the way you think about other people. The gospel is the solution for you changing and growing in becoming the clear image of the God who made you. Do you think America needs some forgiveness right now? Yes or no? Yes. Do you think that America needs some meekness and some kindness and some forbearing and some long-suffering, the words of the verses? Yes, yes, and yes. As much as we need justice and we need change and we need respect and we need equality in many areas, 
we also need forgiveness and mercy in other areas. The gospel is the example for this according to the verses. It is the example in 13. It points us right to what Jesus has done for us. We must forgive others of their wretchedness against us as Jesus Christ died in my place and forgave me of my wretchedness towards him. Unless you think that somehow I am twisting this text to somehow find a passage of scripture that talks about racism, you must not have seen verse number 11 when I read it. Look what it says. And have put on the new man, verse 10, and then 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. The gospel addresses, Jesus' gospel, addresses prejudice and racism that has always existed in all time periods of history. Let me step out of the sermon for a moment. You think we, in our country, have problems with the way that we view other, gr- other groups. When Amy and I went to India, and there are established caste systems where it's not a, there is no thinking that there's anything wrong with treating another group completely as inferior, completely inferior. That your children cannot marry them, that they cannot do certain things, they cannot hold positions, whatever. Prejudice and racism have always been a part of this world. Clear back to New Testament times, clear back farther, the Jews, God's chosen people, through the indwelling sin nature in them, turn that in directly into prejudice and racism towards any other people group. Jesus called it out and called it out in his Gospels. It's always been an issue. It's not an American problem. It's always been an issue. And yet, verse 11 says that it is the Gospel of Jesus Christ received and acted on and 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 that changes progressively me into a clearer image of my God who saved me, who my God says he is no respecter of persons, my God who knew the whole plan, that knew that he would graft in the Gentiles, and that heaven will be filled with every tongue, tribe, and nation to the glory of Jesus Christ, my God tells me to be like him, and to think like him, and that the gospel allows that. And the gospel is what gets up into my brain and teaches me, frankly, so many things that I grew up with in West Virginia that just weren't right at all. Verse 11 is saying that when we take Jesus as our Savior and Lord and we begin living and thinking the gospel, all of those mindsets that divide people, groups, whether it be Greek, Gentile, uh, Jew, barbarian, or nomad warriors, Slaves or free people should be set aside as far as segregating people, holding them at arm's length, treating them disrespectfully, thinking of them as less or as common. We are all sinners saved by the grace of God. And when saved, we are all precious children of the Lord. We are all made kings and priests to our God. We are princes and princesses of Jesus Christ. Jesus' gospel lifts lifts us us up together to a bond that is more important than any earthly class or race or distinction or group. And it's like when you become mature in the gospel that all those things melt away. They must melt away. Jesus' gospel broke down the wall of division between people groups according to Ephesians 2.14 so that Christ could make us all one. One. Christ is all and in all. The end of verse number 11 says, it means that Christ is our identity now and all the differences of this earth are are secondary to him making us one in him. Being in Christ means that our new man longs for the salvation of the unjust police officer, the salvation of the angry protester, the violent looter, the the hurting people of color. The gospel of Jesus Christ tells me that although it may not have came out before I knew Christ, 
as ugly in my heart. I was just like that. I was filled with sin. My heart was desperately wicked, and so was yours. Our hearts break for the broken America. Our new man knows that Christ is the only answer for real and lasting revival in America to have any resemblance to the image of God that they bear. I don't, let me say it this way, I don't polarize a side. I don't push away. I don't polarize a side because I want to bring people to Jesus' side. There are some who would hear this message and agree with it, but think that the days of the power of the gospel is gone in America. I must admit to you as a pastor, there have been many times that I've felt the same. Where is the power of the gospel in America? But I would remind myself and I would remind you that the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ turns wretched sinners into godly saints, just like it did you. I would remind them that salvation, according to our passage, turns dead men into thriving, dedicated men and women praising the Lord. I would remind you that the gospel turns dead people who are craving and hungering and running after sin and grasping anything in this earth that can try to fill the void that is in their heart. It turns that into satisfied, doctrinally sound, gospel-oriented people of God. I would remind you that there has been have been several great awakenings in this country where the power of God fell in the darkest hours. When the people of God stopped looking for government and politics and movements to be the solution and knew the gospel was the solution and cried on the name of the Lord to bring healing and forgiveness through the revival of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there have been several great awakenings in our country where that happened. And lives were changed. And people were born again. And great missionary movements sprung out of this country. And churches would establish more, church, more churches and more churches. And people f- ran and fell at the feet of Jesus Christ. And I believe because I believe in the power of God and the power of the cross and the resurrection that it can happen again. And oh, how we need it. Something is broken. Something's really broken in our country. But Jesus Christ and his gospel are the answers. And what America needs now more than anything else is Jesus' gospel.